Hi there, my name is Pino, and today we're going to be talking about the CS50 Lab 4 volume problem. So as a quick introduction, I wanted to just talk about uh, sound and digital audio, because that's going to be important to understanding how and why this problem works. So here we have a program called Max, which is a visual coding language specifically aimed at audio and sound. And each of these boxes is just a function that Max provides for us so we can quickly do some audio-based programming. So we have a sine wave generator here. We have our multiplier and then just some visual representations of the sounds that we're creating. So you can see here, we're going from negative one to one, which is how Max is gonna represent the farthest your speaker can go forward and the farthest your speaker can go backwards. And that push and pull between these two uh, maximums is how we get our sound. That's how we create the vibration in the air to create actual physical acoustic sound. Now, if we were to multiply every one of these numbers, which are, by the way, streaming much, much faster than we can actually see here. They're about 44,000 times per second. If we multiply every single one of those by 0.5. Now we have a wave that's half as large. We're gonna push and pull half as much and therefore have half the volume. If we do twice as much, we have quite a bit of volume, actually way too much in this case, where the speaker doesn't really know what to do with all this information at the top and the bottom and introduces some clipping and distortion. And then if we go to zero, we have exactly no push and pull at all, no vibration in the air and no sound. So what we're doing in this problem is taking our original input file, where instead of a sine wave like we have here, it'll be some nice uh, piano music, and we're multiplying every single one of these numbers, which from now on we're gonna to refer to as audio samples, which are one specific position that your speaker should be in in order to create this wave. We're gonna multiply every single one of these samples by the user given uh, scaling factor, and that's gonna give us a new file at a different volume. So that's all we really need to know about digital audio in order to get this problem working. So let's get into the code a little bit. I'm gonna go through every single line in order to give you a really, really thorough understanding of what's happening here. <clears throat> if you're just looking for help for uh, specific problems you're running into or looking for a solution to check against, there will be time markers in the video, but I am gonna go through even all of the information that is given to us, just so we can really understand exactly what's happening, and maybe we can extend this in our own way, as you'll see in the next video. <clears throat> so, first, we have the inclusion of all of our libraries, and realistically, you would do this as you program, but because it's at the top, we're just gonna talk about it now. So our standard int library is going to allow us to access some integer data types that we wanna use. Standard IO is going to give us some of these file operations that we need, like reading and writing. And then standard lib is gonna give us printf, uh, just for some error handling and of course debugging along the way. So <clears throat> the first step in getting our skeleton set up is defining a constant integer here called header size and it's equal to 44 and that's because there are 44 bytes in the header of a wave file and the header just tells you some information about what's coming later we have the actual audio data but the first 44 bytes of any wave file is gonna be some information about that audio data. So whatever program is interpreting this file knows that what's coming next is in fact audio information and that I should treat everything here as a WAV file. So 
If we look at our main function, we have some arguments here. The first is going to be an integer called argc, and that's going to be the amount of arguments <coughs> that are provided. So if we use this correctly with our file name, our input name, our output name, and our scaling factor, then we should have four arguments. It does include the name of the program. And that's what we're checking for here. If it's not four, something is wrong about the usage of this program and we're not gonna run it. Our next argument is an array of char stars that we're calling argv. And that's gonna be each of these strings that the user inputs. Again, including the name of the program. <clears throat> and so that's how we're gonna grab our user input in order to set the stage for the rest of this program to run. Next, we're gonna open our files. So we're using this file data type <clears throat> from the standard IO library. And that's going to do a couple things for us. First, it's going to be a pointer to that file's location. So how are we gonna get that? <clears throat> we're gonna run this function f open. The first argument is gonna be the name or really the file path of the file you want to open. In this case, it's input.wave because the file that they've given us to do this manipulation for is called input.wave and it's already in the same folder as the volume program. If it were in a different folder called audio, we would have to specify audio slash input.wave. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, it's already in the same folder, so we just have to type the name of it. And the second argument is going to be the mode that we're opening it. In this case, we're opening it in read mode because all we want to do is read this file and then maybe do some stuff with the information that we read from it. Um, and the other thing, and this took me a while to really uh, understand and solved a lot of problems for me, is that this is going to keep track of where we are in that file. So every time we do some operation on this file with our, as we see, our fread and fwrite later on, it's going to keep track of where that happens. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later, but uh, just important to keep in mind for now. And then again, we're gonna do the exact same thing with our output file. We take our next argument, which in this case is output.wave, though you could call this anything you want. And we're gonna open it in write mode, which means that we're gonna write to this file. And in fact, if it already exists, we're gonna overwrite it. If it does not already exist, we're gonna create it. So if you don't have output.wave in your file path already, it will be created. If you do have it in there already, it will be destroyed and then recreated. All right, and then we just have some error handling. If we don't end up getting that pointer that we want, something goes wrong here, uh, we're just gonna cut it. We're gonna exit the program and say we couldn't open it, do better next time. All right, and then the last argument is our scaling factor. This is how we're gonna actually multiply each of those audio samples. And one thing to, that's important to know is that what the computer ends up getting is something like that, which is a string, or in this case, just a char, and it can't really do any math with that. So we have to just convert that to an actual float value using this function a to f, ASCII to float. So if you give it a char of a number, it's gonna actually convert it to an actual number that we can do some math with. And that's gonna get us our main setup here. Um, we've got our constants, we've got all of our user input stored and ready to be used. So the next step is going to be to copy the header from our input file to our output file. And there's no manipulation going on here. So we want it to be copied exactly. And the way we're gonna do that is first create a buffer, create some temporary storage to store that header. It's just generally best practice when we're reading and writing from files to have some temporary storage in the middle 
especially if we need to actually do something to that information before we write it out again, uh, that's where we would do it. So we're going to create an array with 44 elements. As we've defined up there, header size is going to be 44. And like we talked about, the header of a WAV file is 44 bytes. So we want to store 44 bytes. An unsigned 8-bit integer is just going to be one byte of storage. And that is, in fact, the type of information that we're going to be storing here. So that's what we're doing here, just creating an array. It's going to hold the exact amount of information that we want to work with for right now. Next, we're going to actually read that information from our input file. So fread and fwrite can be a little finicky. So let's discuss exactly how this is working. When we use fread, we're going to read from the right to the left. All right. So we're reading from our input file 44 bytes to our header array. All right, so let's, let's kind of discuss this a little bit. The input and the output of fread and fwrite need to be pointers. Input is a pointer specified up here to be a pointer to the input file. So we don't need to dereference this. We don't need any address. Like we're, we're already there. We already have our pointer to our file. Header is going to be a pointer to the first element of this header array, because that's how arrays are going to work in C for us. They're really, when we call the name of an array, it's just a pointer to the first element of that array. And then we can, we can you know, do some stuff with it as we need. So that's our ins or our ins and outs of fread. Now, the rest of this and the rest of these arguments in here are going to be the amount of items here and then the size of each of those items. So we want to read 44 bytes. So the amount of items is going to be 44 or header size. And then we need to specify that we're going to do 44 bytes. And as I said up here, an unsigned 8-bit integer takes up the space of one byte. So this size of function, what that's going to do is return to us the size in bytes of whatever data type we put in there. So we have here already ready to go, 44 bytes from our input to our header. All right. So we're basically here just taking that entire header from our input file and storing it in this header array now. Next, we need to write that from our header to our output file. Okay, and here's a little weird thing about this where now in fwrite, here is our input and here's our output where before here was input, here was output. So they're just, they're just swapped here. Um, but the middle two arguments stay the same. So now we're saying that header array that now has our wave file header, we're going to write 44 bytes from that, which happens to be the whole thing, to our output file. So now we've successfully copied the entire header from our input to our output. And if you've done that correctly, you should now have a play bar when you click on output.wave. If you've run this without any of the audio copying, you should still see a play bar just with zero seconds because VS Code will now know, okay, this is a wave file. I see that whole wave header. I'm going to display a play bar because that's what I do with wave files. Okay. If you see something like error or, or whatever, something may have gone wrong and you may not have successfully copied that entire header. All right. But now we've got our wave header in our output files. So now all we have to do is actually copy all of the audio information. So before I go into that exactly, let's just remember 
what I said about that internal counter of where you are in the file. Because now we've already read the first 44 bytes of our input and written the first 44 bytes of our output. So both of these counters are now going to be at the 45th byte. So when we run our next file operation, it's going to start at that 45th byte. So at no point do we actually have to specify to jump to that byte to skip the header when we're copying our audio information. It's already there. So we're ready to go in that regard. And that was another thing that really confused me. I was trying to do like input plus 44 or something like that. And I didn't understand how it knew exactly where to start all of this business. And that's how it does it. It just keeps track for you. If you do need to change it, you can use an operation called fseek, and that will allow you to change that counter and jump to a different point in the file, or even something called ftel, which is going to report to you where in the file you are right now. And um, <clears throat> that's how we can kind of jump around or find out where we are if we need that, which we will in the next video. But for right now, we're doing everything from top to bottom anyway, so we really don't have to worry about that. Um, all right, so in order to do this, we're gonna use fread again in a slightly different way for two reasons. First, instead of copying that entire chunk of information that we want, we're gonna copy exactly one audio sample at a time because we wanna be able to change that sample on the sample level. We're not working with chunks anymore. We want to work with the individual sample to perform this operation here. So in this fread, we're going from our input, we're going to read one item. That item is the size of a 16-bit integer or two bytes. And we're gonna read that to our buffer. All right, and I think I skipped kind of an important step. So let's go over what this buffer is. This is just a variable that stores a 16-bit integer. How did we get to a 16-bit integer? Well, it's a pretty simple uh, formula here. In order to calculate the amount of bytes in an audio sample, we need to know our bit depth and the number of channels of that audio file. In this case, the bit depth is 16, and there's one channel. So 16 times 1 divided by 8, we get 2. So 2 bytes for every sample, and that's going to be number, right? So we're storing that as a 2-byte integer, or 16-bit integer. Um, bit depth really is just like the resolution of all of the numbers between the minimum range and the maximum. So how specific you can get with the volume of a sample. And then the number of channels is just like stereo, you have a left and a right, you have two channels, or mono, you just have one channel. But as long as you know these things, you don't even really need to know what they're for. You just need to know the numbers so you can get the number of bytes per sample, which in this case is two. And that's why when we call size of, a 16-bit integer, it returns a two for two bytes. So again, we're reading from our input one item that is two bytes large to our buffer, our temporary variable here. And like I said earlier, these inputs and outputs do need to be pointers. We didn't need to specify the address of anything earlier because input is already a pointer to our input file. and earlier header was an array and when we call the name header it's just a pointer to the first element of that array in this case buffer is an actual variable itself so we do need to specify that we're going to be reading into the address of this buffer reading from our input to the address of this buffer okay so now we have read our one item our first audio sample. And you'll notice it's inside of a while loop because we do need to do this quite a few more times, about 88,000 more times. So when we do fread, we're going to return the amount of items successfully read. 
So in this case, we're asking it to return exactly one item, and that's exactly what it will return. It's going to return a one. Therefore, this is true, and we're gonna continue with everything inside of it. So we have our buffer variable filled with a piece of information from our input. Now we have to do <clears throat> the actual volume scaling, which is probably the simplest part of this whole program. We're just gonna multiply it by the factor that the user inputs. And it's really as simple as that. If you multiply every single audio sample by 0.5, the wave is going to be shrunk to half its height <clears throat> and therefore be half the volume. So now we just need to write this new variable, this new number to our output file. <clears throat> and we're gonna use fwrite for that um, in a very similar way to what we've done before, which is again from our buffer, which we need to specify as a pointer. We're gonna read, or we're gonna write one item that is two bytes large to our output file. And it's as simple as that. Now we just continue this loop over and over and over again until we get to the very end of the file where it can no longer successfully read any information. So it will finally return a zero. It has not successfully read the item. Therefore, this loop will exit because this will be false. And then we've copied everything, we've scaled it, and now all we have to do is close our files. And this is actually a very important step um, for memory leaking, and then also because the way that this output file is being written is actually um, a bit of a two-step process where C under the hood is creating some temporary storage for us to write this file and it never actually gets written until to output.wave <clears throat> until we close it, until we run fclose on that pointer to our output file. Um, that is when we actually write this file. So this is actually uh, dynamic. We never have to specify the length of this output file. And that's another thing I was very confused about for a while, uh, but it, it just kind of handles it for us. So that's pretty much it. That's, uh, that's how this one works. Uh, my two main points of confusion were where in this file we're doing all of this reading and writing and why we never have to specify the length of this output file. And it turns out both of those are just things that C will handle for us. So that's volume. I hope this has helped to uh, really solidify your understanding of what's going on here, both what they've given you and what you have to do in order to solve this problem. In the next video, we're gonna look at one way that I extended this in order to create a granular synthesizer. And hopefully that will um, inspire you to extend this in some other way and do some things that you might want to do with an audio file. But until then, uh, have a nice day. Thanks for watching.